episode 2 of Asterix and the Indomitable audio series. Welcome to it. My name is Alan, hoping that you are doing well and you got into the new year all safe and sound and uh, things are going smoothly for you so far. I'm okay. It's uh, been a while since uh, episode 1 came out. Uh, things didn't go my way in December, but finally had the chance to sit down and get this done and here it is now so if you listen to this for the first time you didn't catch episode one please check the description you will find a link to episode one so you can pause this go back and check out episode one in which we looked at volume one of the asterix comic book series asterix the goal so you can check that out Today, though, we are looking at Volume 2, Book 2, Album 2, which is Asterix and the Golden Sickle. Now, for me, this is the book that got me into the Asterix series way back in primary school. There was this uh, library copy, a battered old copy, that uh, uh, my uh, former classmate of mine and I, we would read that copy you know we take turns reading character dialogue um, and you know, it was fun learning about all these all these characters and unfortunately with that copy it was missing a lot of pages and it would be several years before i found out how you know things ended so um as we go through the story i'll be sure to let you know at which point that uh, copy ended and well at least this time around we've got a complete story you know so I'm looking forward to diving into it if you have your own copy of Asterix and the Golden Sickle you are free to have it with you on the side there will be a couple of times where I'll mention a certain page and you can turn to it to see what I'm talking about if you don't have a copy in the description you will find a an internet archive link to where you can read a copy of Asterix and the Golden Sickle online. So let us have a look at this book. Obviously it was written by Rene Corsini with uh, Albert Uderzo being the illustrator. It was first published, first serialized I should say, in the French and Belgian comics magazine pilot from issue number 42 up to issue number 74 between 1960 and 1961 and then it was published as a collected volume in 1962 by Dagod, I hope I got this right, D-A-R-G-A-U-D this is a publishing company in France which was founded by a man named Georges de Gard in 1936. This company also published the Tintin magazine and another comic that uh, Gossini co-created, maybe some of you have heard of it, Lucky Luke. Um, maybe at some point, someday, once we are, we've caught up in Asterix, we'll look into Lucky Luke, because uh, I remember there was a live action TV series way back in the early 90s. That's my my earliest memory of, of Lucky Luke. I didn't know that it was based on a comic comic book series. So I think that would be something worth diving into um, at some point. Then, of course, the English translation for Asterix and the Golden Sickle was done by Anthea Bell and Derek Hawkridge. It was published by Brockhampton Press in 1975. Okay, so like with any good Asterix adventure, it is 50 BC. All of Gaul has been occupied by the Romans, or except for one small village of indomitable Gauls who have held out against invaders. The same small village is, however, surrounded by four fortified camps, Aquarium, Totorum, Lodanum, 
and compendium. So our adventure begins in that village. It's a peaceful day. Everyone is going about their business. We see Asterix arriving in the village from a hunt in the forest. He's caught himself a boar. We see Obelix. He is busy at the quarry working on a manor. Cacophonix. He's got a class going. He's teaching some kids some mathematics. And um, you think everything is going smoothly until there's a great shout from beyond the village and it startles the villagers so they hurry out to investigate what's going on they get to a, a big oak tree they gather around it asterix he recognizes whose voice that was and he tells obelix as they run out that it was getafix so everyone gets to the oak tree and they see the, the old droid, he's climbing down the tree, he's all raging and swearing. He's very upset. And so Asterix asks him, what's, what's, what's going on? And Getafix reveals that uh, his very special golden sickle is broken. One of the ingredients of the magic potion that is brewed by, by Getafix is mistletoe. And in order for mistletoe to have the special powers, that it is known for, it must be cut by a golden sickle. So Asterix suggests, uh, okay, you might as well just buy a new one, you know. But Getafix tells him that he only uses sickles that are made by a man named Metallurgix, who lives in Lutetia, which is modern-day Paris. What perfect timing to break a golden sickle, because uh, unfortunately for Getafix, um, he tells Asterix and the others that there's an important event known as the great annual conference of Gaulish Druids, which takes place in the forest of the Canutes. And he can't go to this conference without a gold sickle. Just on a, on a side note, the Canutes, uh, C-A-R-N-U-T-E-S, the Canutes, they were a Gallic tribe from the Iron Age and the Roman period. So that's where the Forest of the Canutes is named after them. So, eager to help the druid Asterix volunteers to travel to Lutetia to meet with the uh, Metallurgix. But, uh, and Getafix is grateful for him wanting to help, but he thinks that uh, it would be too dangerous, you know, which is funny because Asterix is the one who volunteered and so it's just a little funny that he thinks it's too dangerous even for, for Asterix. But then when Asterix decides, okay, fine, uh, never mind then, that's when Getafix is like, okay, okay, I'll agree to you going on to the trip so you can go. And Obelix, he's there as well and he, he says, okay, I'll come along as well. And he reveals that Metallurgix is a distant cousin of his. A distant cousin? but uh, he's very successful, wouldn't you know it? So the goals they return to the village, achieve vital statistics, he's there, he wishes Asterix and Obelix good luck for their journey, and of course, get a fix, he gives Asterix gourd of uh, some magic potion, can't go on an important trip without some magic potion. So after that, Carcophonix, he also shows up, he wants to sing a departure song for the two goals but uh you know the goal the other villagers they're like uh have got better things to do so before cacophonics get a chance gets a chance to sing his his farewell song everyone disperses uh for their own good reasons and so our two heroes they leave the village they enter the forest and uh, obelix he's got himself a uh, a man here that is carrying a little gift for cousin Metallurgix while uh, Asterix um, he decides to take a drink of magic potion because he's heard that the forest is full of bandits so he needs to be he needs to be on alert unfortunately no magic potion for Obelix as we know he fell into a big cauldron of magic potion when he was a baby and so now this uh, 
this is where we get the ongoing gag oblix once magic potion is involved you know oblix he also wants his own um share of the magic potion but he's always being told no you can't have magic potion oblix you fell into a cauldron of it when you're a baby so it would be dangerous for you to have some now so he delivers this uh, this hilarious line all these feeble excuses about me falling into the cauldron of potion when I was a baby just to stop me from having any it's, it's not fair so yes that's classic obelix there so he asks Asterix if he's got anything to pay for the sickle and Asterix he tells obelix that he's got uh, 100 gold coins for the sickle and some bronze coins, bronze coins as well which should cover any quote-unquote incidental expenses and sure enough as they are going on about money wouldn't you know it a group of bandits appears to ambush the two goals they want that money your money or your life and uh, unfortunately for the bandits they picked the wrong goals to try and hijack because the two goals they make quick work of the bandits and they just carry on with their journey I mean as they are beating up these bandits they actually have a conversation like uh, you know nothing unusual is going on you know and Asterix he's just hoping that they won't be slowed down by any more bandits uh, along the way in the evening they make it onto the Roman road and they see in just off the road an establishment called the Contrite Barbarian which is famous for roast boar good news for Obelix it is run by a goth man, judging by uh, his accent. If you've got uh, the comic, you can check out the font of his text, Bubbles, to indicate that he is um, from the goth tribe. Um, he's ready to give them a room for the night and some dinner as well. And uh, while the two girls are eating, he asks where they're headed. And uh, Asterix tells them that they're, they're going to Letitia. And there's another uh, patron who's there eating at a nearby table. He overhears this. He goes over to Asterix and Obelix and he tells them that he's from Lutetia and things aren't going so well over there. Apparently, sickles are in short supply. And uh, Obelix, well, he's an optimist. He just tells them, uh, we know where to go. He's not worried about uh, things not going too well in Lutetia. Then in the morning, the two goals are back on the road. Obelix asks Asterix if, if he has any idea why that goal would tell them about sickles being in short supply. But Asterix, he doesn't have a clue. He figures, well, it will be something they'll have to worry about once they get to Leticia. Uh, their journey, of course, is eventful because sure enough, they encounter more bandits along the way but they're no trouble for our heroes and eventually they make it to Suindna which is the modern day which is the Latin name for what is known today as La Mar it's a, it's a town in France but um, they can't find any accommodation because when they arrive there it's on the day of a great ox cart race known as the Suindam, Suindna 24 hours which is a nice little reference to an actual annual sports car race which is the 24 hours of Le Mans maybe some of you are sports car fans you might have heard of this um, but eventually the two goals they arrive in Lutetia which is quite a sight for the two goals We've come from a village in the north northwest coast seeing Leticia, which is a bustling place with crowded streets, busy roads and a polluted river. Unfortunately this is uh, you know the river Seine. They uh, approach a fisherman who isn't having much luck catching fish. Uh, all he has reeled in so far are uh, empty amphoras. Uh, these were ancient jars. They were mainly used to hold oil or, or wine. 
So this fisherman uh, after asks asks him if he knows of uh, metallurgics. The fisherman directs them to where metallurgics house is. Um, the two girls they get to the house. Asterix knocks on the door, but there's no response. A next door neighbor he looks out the window just to see who's uh, knocking at metallurgics house. Asterix tells them that that they're here for metallurgics. And the neighbor, he suddenly looks worried now and tells them that Metallurgics isn't there anymore and it would be a good idea if the two goals left right away. And so Obelix, he thinks this is a little weird and he suggests maybe they break into the house. But uh, Asterix, uh, he stops him from doing that because nearby a uh, group of Roman uh, patrolmen is uh, on his own is on the way, so Asterix thinks it would be a good idea if they just uh, left the area, maybe maybe ask someone else. And they get to a nearby pub, which is run by an Avernian landlord. The name of this pub, of course, is the Mary Avernian. The Avernians, the Averni, I should say, were another Gaelic tribe from the Iron Age and the Roman period who lived in what is now the Auvergne region in uh, in France. It's a central region in France. So after ordering a couple of beers and having a brief chat with the landlord, um, Asterix asks him if he's seen Metallurgics. The landlord, he suddenly, he looks shocked as well after hearing the name of uh, this missing sickle dealer. And uh, his mood suddenly changes also. He's no longer as friendly as when Asterix and Oblix arrived and he starts telling them to hurry up because it's closing time. So you now the girls, they finish up their beers and they leave, surprised that uh, this man is now hostile all of a sudden. After the girls leave, the landlord, he sneaks out of his shop. He goes over to another building and uh, he knocks on the door. Someone answers, it's a tall looking girl who's uh, dressed in a striped vest. Uh, this unknown man, um, he hears from the landlord that a couple of girls are looking for metallurgics. And so this man, he pays the landlord after receiving that information and he decides to go and look for Asterix and Obelix. So he's moving through the crowds in town and it doesn't take him very long to pinpoint the two goals because Obelix is carrying that mena on his on his back so uh, this unknown man he sees them just up ahead so what he does is he gets like behind them and then he turns a corner and he rounds a building runs all the way around just in time to bump into Asterix and Obelix and you know while after apologizing and uh, checking that they are okay, he asks the two girls if he can help them since they don't look like they're from around here. And Asterix tells them, tells him that they are looking for metallurgics, um, who just so happens to be this unknown man's best friend. So this guy says, oh, what a, what a coincidence. So he agrees to help the two girls and he leads them to a tavern where they can buy another sickle. They enter the tavern, it's a packed place, there's a live band going on and all, but the two, three goals, they manage to find a table. And um, Asterix, uh, once they've settled down, he reminds this man that they've come here for sickles. So this man, he leaves to go and get the owner of the tavern. And a couple of minutes later, he comes back with a uh, a well-dressed looking girl who introduces himself as Navish Trix. And thanks to him, we learn the name of this unknown man, Clover Garlix. So Navish Trix has been made aware of the situation and uh, he's willing to sell Asterix one golden sickle for 3,000 gold coins. And Asterix is taken aback by this. Can't really blame him because he came with a hundred gold coins, and to him, that seemed like a fair price for a gold for a sickle. You know? uh, but Navy Strix, he says he can either take it or leave it. 
that's the price and given that there's uh, this druid conference coming up well uh, this equals hard to come by if you don't want to take it no problem someone else probably will but this is too much for Asterix because uh, he thinks this is daylight robbery but Navy Strix is not having any of this and he starts walking away he tells Clover Garlics get rid of this small timer he's not eager to do any business with them Asterix takes a swig of that magic potion and he sends Navy Strix flying with one punch and before you know it a big fight begins with everyone in the tavern fighting these two goals and while the action is going on one of the, the patrons he sounds the alarm a Roman patrol has arrived it's a raid and so everyone is rushing out of the tavern while Asterix and Obelix are left wondering oh why is everyone leaving what's going on and the leader of uh, the, the Roman soldiers uh, the Curio he shows up he asks the two goals if they are responsible for all this damage and uh, Asterix he says yeah that's us so now the Decurion says, well, you'll have, to you'll have to explain yourselves to the Centurion. So the two goals are escorted out of the tavern, and they had marched to the residence of the Prefect of Lutetia. At the front desk, they meet up with the Centurion, and the Decurion explains that the two goals, um, they were found at the tavern, and they roughed up the place. And so the Centurion, he orders for the two goals to be locked up in prison until they are sentenced uh, but Asterix he protests against this and uh, he starts a shouting match with the Centurion until a servant of the Prefect shows up tells them that uh, you guys the Prefect is having his dinner and he's being disturbed by your noise he wants to know what's going on so the Centurion he escorts the two goals to the Prefect's room and they into the room and they meet the man, the prefect of Lutetia surplus dairy produce. Which is a fitting name for this man because uh, he's a uh, he's a really fat man and he's you know he's lounging on his on his couch having his fried chicken like uh, without any trouble in the world. So the centurion he brings the prefect up to speed about what's going on and uh, the prefect uh, he is not really like angry or anything. He's he's looking at these two goals and he's like, "You guys are so boring. All you guys do is fight." So he he decides that you know what, just just let these guys go. Uh, just get on with their business. He's, he's not really too bothered about this. So as the two goals are leaving with the centurion. Asterix finds out that all the Asterix, uh, he tells the centurion that all they wanted to do was to buy a golden sickle, you know. And um, this is when uh, the centurion he tells them that oh, there's this gang of uh, golden sickle traffickers that is uh, operating in Lutetia, and so uh, Metallurgix um, has gone missing all of a sudden. Uh, Centurion has no idea if Metallurgix has been kidnapped or he's been murdered. They have no idea what's going on. So the two goals now, they leave the residence, they're back on the streets. And uh, Obelix is visibly upset about um, what has happened to his cousin. They don't know what has happened to him. Um, Asterix, he asks Obelix, have you any idea what Metallurgix looks like? which you know might help them identify him but Obelix he tells Asterix that he's never seen uh, his cousin he's never met him he has no idea what he looks like which is great now because if they don't know what he looks like how are they going to identify him now so Asterix he decides okay let's go back to Metallurgix's house maybe you'll find some clues over there so the two goals make it back to Metallurgix's house and the door is still locked but this time Obelix he simply pushes the door open with one finger. Inside it's clear that a fight took place 
Metallurgics' personal belongings are present. But he is money and his sickles are gone. And for Asterix, this makes him certain that Metallurgics is still alive. And so he vows that they will find Metallurgics and uh, they decide to stay in the house for the time being. The next day, our two heroes, they leave Lutetia and they set off for Gogovia in pursuit of the Avernian landlord. Now, Gogovia was a Gaulish town and was the site of the Battle of Gogovia. This is where uh, that famous uh, Avernian chieftain, um, I'm trying to remember his name, Virkin Getorix. We saw him in the first book, one of the first panels um, of Asterix, the Gaul. You'll see a picture of him laying his, uh, his arms, not at the feet of Caesar, but on the feet of, of Caesar. That was uh, Virkin Getorix. So, Asterix and Obelix, they get onto Roman Road 7, which at this point is packed with traffic, but uh, they manage to to weave their way through because they are there on two feet. Um, and soon enough, they spot the landlord's ox-drawn cart up ahead, and they start making their way towards him. The landlord, he looks back, he sees Asterix and Obelix approaching, and uh, he tries to speed up, but uh, his oxen, uh, well, they're taking their sweet time, and soon enough, Obelix, he overtakes the, the oxen, and he stops in front of them, stopping the cart. And Asterix he gets a hold of the landlord, and he demands to know where Metallurgix is. Um, at first, the Avernian, he won't, won't say anything, but he yields, and uh, he says that he saw Metallurgix being taken away by some men one day. They were going to take the landlord, but one of the men, who turned out to be Clover Garlix, agreed to leave the landlord alone as long as he kept Clover Garlix informed about anyone who would come around looking for metallurgics. And so afterwards, the landlord, he gives the goals Clover Garlix's address, and they return to Letitia. They reach Clover Garlix's house, they find that it is locked, they break in, they look around, nobody's there, so Asterix, he suggests that they search the place anyway. But, uh, you know, these two guys, they are searching, is, it's not quiet, it's super loud, and this draws the attention of um, a patrolling troop of soldiers, which is being led by that Dakurian from earlier, who found them at the tavern. He sees the two goals and, uh, you know, he's surprised to see them again. And he escorts Asterix and Obelix out of Clover Garlix's house. They go back to the prefect's residence. But this time, they go straight to the cells. And in the cell where Asterix and Obelix are is another goal who's had uh, one too many drinks. He, He's trying to say long live working Getrix, but he keeps getting working Getrix's name wrong. But um, Asterix, he speaks to this man and he asks him if he... Well, actually, the man, um, he asks Asterix and Obelix what they're in for. And Asterix, he tells them, tells him that they're looking for Clover Garlix. And so this goal, he says that he knows him because he used to work for Navy Tricks. And um, he says he often heard them making arrangements to meet under a doorman. Um, a doorman was a, uh, a sort of tomb um, from, from way back, a uh, prehistoric age. You would um, identify it by, there would be two, um, usually two uh, upright stones, and on top of the stones would be a, a capstone. That's, that's a doorman. And so with that information, Asterix and Obelix, they bust out of the cell, followed by this, this drunk, uh, drunk hole. They, they make it all the way outside, but they are spotted by guards, and the alarm is raised.
Asterix and Oblix, they start fighting their way through the legionaries up until the prefect's servant shows up because of the noise. And uh, you know what happens? Everyone is escorted to the prefect's room. But as for the drunk Cole, he tries to, to escape only to be recaptured and taken back to his cell. So when Asterix and Obelix meet up with the surplus dairy produce again, uh, despite all the damage that they've done, messing up Clover Galaxy's house, breaking out of a cell, beating up uh, not just one but seven legionaries, the ghouls are set free by Prefect because he finds what they've done to be highly amusing. He's just having fun with all this, so he lets them go. So Asterix and Obelix are back on the streets of Lutetia. Now they have to find the location of Navy tricks and Clover Galaxy's meetings. But does Lutetia have any dormants around? They're not sure. So, as they continue walking through the streets, Asterix sees a tourism uh, business just up ahead and considers maybe they'll find some answers there. They get to the, to the tourism business, which is run by a Roman by the name of Claudius Omnibus. Um, who works as a guide for people who are interested in looking around the city. So Asterix asks him if, well, he tells him that they wish to see some dormants, um, but he's told that there are no dormants in Lutetia, but Claudius has heard of um, at least one dormant, which is in the forest over where the sun sets. It's good news for the ghouls. They are ready to go and... Uh, on a tour to find this dormant, but uh, Claudius, he, is, um, he turns them down because he's heard that this forest um, is full of wolves and bandits. And so the two ghouls would have to make their way on their own without a guide. Um, on this page, this is on page 28, if you've got the comic, on the bottom right panel, right after Asterix and Obelix have left the, the tourism business, we get our very first sighting of one more uh, popular character from the Asterix cast, Dogmatics. Um, uh, the funny thing is, as Asterix and Obelix are walking away, uh, Obelix, he doesn't notice the dog, but the dog, he's looking up at Obelix, he notices him, and I just thought it was worth worth mentioning. If you've got the comic, you can turn to page page 28 to see Dogmatics for the very first time. Uh, I'm not sure now which book Dogmatics is officially introduced, but um, at least we get to see him now. And I just try to imagine what people were reading this this volume for the very first time way back in the in the 60s or the 70s seeing this little dog just this this one panel on this page not knowing that that little dog would go on to be one of the most recognized characters in, in comic books so it's just nice to see him there so the forest that asterix and obelix are going towards would go on to become what is known today as bois de boulogne hope i got that right B O I S D E B O U L O G N E Bois de Boulogne. This is a public park which is in Paris, the second largest public park in Paris. So if any of you are from France, you'll know what I'm talking about. The girls leave Lutetia, they make their way to the forest. By the time they get to the forest, it is nightfall now, and as they enter the forest, the first thing they hear is the howling of a wolf. They follow the sound, and it leads them to a pack of wolves that has surrounded a tree. And uh, as they are assessing the scene, uh, there's a voice that comes from the tree, hoping that uh, the two ghouls uh, can take care of the wolves and help him out. So Asterix and Obelix, they deal with the wolves. Once the wolves have been taken care of and sent away from this tree, climbs down a shabby-looking fellow. He's about the same height as Asterix, 
um, but he's got a club um, attached to his belt, and so he introduces himself as a bandit, uh, which is comical because when Asterix and Obelix arrived in the forest, they made a bet as to what would they encounter first. Would it be wolves or bandits? Asterix, he bets that they'll find wolves, and Obelix, he bets on bandits. And so Asterix, he won the bet because they, they encountered wolves first. So when this bandit um, appears from, from the tree, Obelix gets a hold of him. And he's shaking him about, saying, you know, you could if you'd come, if you'd appeared earlier, I would have won the bet. So this guy is visibly shaken, but they're all there. There we have our, our first appearance of a bandit. And so Asterix, he asks the bandit if he is, uh, if he knows of any doorman, any doormans in this forest. And the bandit, he knows of one doorman, which is near a, a big oak tree that's in the middle of the forest. But not even this bandit um, wants to go there and he, he hightails it before Asterix and Obelix can, can make their way to, to the middle of the forest with him. So they continue their journey to the middle of the forest, but soon it starts to rain and it turns into a full-blown thunderstorm. So Asterix and Obelix, they have to wander through the forest in the dark, making their way until they can find uh, some shelter and wait out the storm. After the storm passes and the moon comes out to light the forest up so that Asterix and, and Obelix can see their way, they realize that the shelter that they um, were waiting under was the doorman that they were looking for. So Asterix he decides that um, they'll, they'll spend the night here and uh, they climb into the oak tree and they, they fall asleep. In the morning, Asterix wakes up and he notices that someone is approaching and he, he wakes up Obelix. That someone turns out to be Clover Garlix. Now this is the page. This is page 32 of the comic. This is where that library copy ended for, for me and my friends. So, yeah, what a, what a cliffhanger. But, hey, fortunately, got to see how things end. So let's Let's continue. Now Obelix is eager to, to get Clover Garlix, but, but Asterix suggests that they wait and see what happens. Um, but Obelix is against this, and you know, the two of them, they start arguing. While they're arguing, Clover Garlix, he suddenly vanishes. And when Asterix and Obelix, they turn around to see what happened to Clover Garlix, and they don't, they don't see him there, they climb down from the oak tree, look around startled because he was there just a moment ago he's gone what happened so Obelix he volunteers to look around maybe find some clues as he's walking away he suddenly falls through the ground and Asterix realizes there's a trap door um, where Obelix fell through so Asterix he takes a swig of magic potion and he jumps into the hole after Obelix underground they land in what looks like a tunnel so they look around they follow the tunnel all the way to a room which is occupied by a bunch of golden sickles plenty of golden sickles for druids of all sizes whether you're a small druid or a medium-sized druid a large druid or an outsized druid there's a sickle for you here and so while Asterix and Obelix are looking around, marveling at what they've found. Here comes Navy Strix, Clover Garlix, and their men. And it looks like the Gauls have found Navy Strix's golden sequel depot. And so Navy Strix, he orders his men to seize the two Gauls. But uh, Asterix has had his magic potion, so he and Obelix, they fight off the two men. And uh, in the scaffold, Navy Strix, he manages to make his escape. Uh, realizing what has happened, he says, you know, he needs to warn the boss. So he makes his escape. Uh, after the fight, Asterix, he 
looks around, looking for navy streaks, they don't find him. But Obelix, he finds clover garlics in a pile of, of uh, knocked out guys. And um, he picks up clover garlics and Asterix demands that they tell him where where uh, Metallurgix is with navy streaks. Uh, clover garlics at first, he's not eager to tell them. But uh, after being threatened by Obelix, he, he reveals that this place was just an underground store where navy streaks would bring golden sickles that Metallurgix would make. Metallurgix is being held prisoner by navy streaks' boss, but Clover Garlix explains that he's never seen this boss. He's no idea who he is. Uh, so, Asterix and Obelix, they decide to leave in pursuit of navy streaks, but just to make sure that the golden sickles aren't going anywhere, when they make it outside, they take the the capstone, the big capstone, and they cover the where the trap door is, just to make sure that you know Clover Garlix isn't tempted to to run away with the, with those those golden sickles. So the two goals, they make it back to Utisha, and it turns out that the day that they arrive, it's market day. And they arrive to see a number of ven a number of vendors that are out and about selling their goods. So they hope that they can find Navy Streaks quickly before uh, he gets to his boss. Meanwhile, Navy Streaks is in the area. He approaches one of the stalls, which is occupied by a butcher. So he asks for a steak so that he can he can nurse his black eye. But he doesn't get a chance to recover because Asterix and Obelix, they spot him from afar. And so Navy Strix, he takes off again with Asterix and Obelix in hot pursuit. But they don't get to Navy Strix because while Asterix and Obelix are running about, they bump into that Roman patrol again being led by the Decurian. And uh, this becomes, you know, it's become a running gag now where Asterix and Obelix keep bumping into this Roman patrol. And so they're taken back to the prefect's residence, back to the cells, but this time they are separated. Obelix is put into his own cell. Asterix is bound uh, with a, his hands uh, chained behind him. He is put into another cell, which just so happens to be occupied by that drunk goal from before. So unfortunately, Asterix, because his arms are chained behind him, he can't reach for the the gourd of magic potion so he could escape. So he turns to the drunk or he asks him, hey, could you could you reach for the gourd of magic potion? And the drunk or, of course, he's thinking of, of alcohol. So he, ask, he asks Asterix if that gourd of magic potion, does it, does it have anything good? And you know, Asterix is, he wants to escape, so he's a little short with this, with this drunk goal telling him, please, quickly, could you get the magic potion for me? Uh, but the drunk, he he's not too happy about Asterix being upset with him, so, you know, he goes into a corner and he starts sulking because Asterix won't let him take a, take a drink. But Asterix, he, he calms down and he says, okay, you can, you can have a, a taste of, 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 the, of this drink. It's, it's good stuff. And uh, the other goal, he turns around and uh, he takes the gourd, he gives Asterix a drink, and then he uh, proceeds to take uh, a drink of the magic potion, finishing what's, what's, what's remaining of the magic potion. And so Asterix, he frees himself from the chain, busts out of his cell with the drunk goal following him, now having, you know, taken a drink of that magic potion. What could possibly go wrong? So Asterix, he tells Obelix, hey, it's time to leave. Obelix, he busts out of his cell and they start making their way out of the cells. But uh, the drunk you know, he's had his magic potion. He is now trying to uh, start up his chant again of long live uh, King Getrix. Well, um, Asterix is trying to to keep him quiet, but it's it's not working. While this is going on, you know the noise 
has attracted the centurion and uh, his men. They can hear the, the calls making their way out of the cells. And so he prepares uh, the legionaries to meet the goals. And once the goals, they make it out of the cells, uh, they are met by the soldiers and they have to, you know, start fighting their way out of, uh, through the soldiers. They succeed in defeating the first wave of soldiers, but another wave is approaching now. So, Asterix and Obelix, they decide to try and find the exit. That drunk goal is still um, full of magic potions, so he just uh, makes his way past the two guards who are, you know, manning the, the main entrance, and he walks out scot free. Uh, he, I think, the the running gag that has been going on with uh, this drunk goal, he's been trying to say, you know, long live King Ketrix, and he's failed each time. But when he finally makes his escape now, he succeeds in saying the first half of Long Live Working Gatrix's name. Um, but then, you know, just before he completes the name, he just says the equivalent to, you know, Long Live Working uh, that guy. You know, so I just thought that, that was, you know, uh, a gag paid off. So I thought that was, that was pretty funny. So back to Asterix and Obelix, they are wandering through one of the, the buildings in the residence and they reach a door which is guarded by um, one of the soldiers and he tells them to halt because the room is occupied by the prefect which is the person that uh, Asterix and Obelix are hoping to see so they just you know, swat this guy aside and they burst into the room they find the prefect and his subordinate navy tricks. Well, well, well. So the centurion and uh, his men, they also arrive into this room looking to punish Asterix and Obelix. But Asterix, he tells the centurion that the prefect is the man who is behind the golden sickle trafficking operation. But of course the, pre the centurion doesn't believe, doesn't believe this until surplus dairy produce speaks up and confirms that indeed he is the man behind the operation the jig is up old sport and uh, he says that he, he just did it for a bit of fun just to make some money on the side uh, seeing how bored considering how bored he is uh, being around here so you know he just wanted to do something interesting and so uh, Asterix, he asks uh, the prefect where Metallurgix is and uh, surplus dairy produce, he tells them all he's in the cellar. So Asterix and Obelix, they rush down to the cellar, they burst through and who's the first person who speaks? Obelix, when he sees his dear cousin Metallurgix, who just so happens to look like Obelix, like face the uh, hairstyle as well, but he's, he's a short fellow. I think he's about the same same height as Asterix. But I just thought this was comical because not too long ago, Asterix had asked Obelix, what does your cousin look like? And there we saw Obelix saying he's never seen the man. He's never seen him, he's never met him before. But here we are, and he immediately recognizes Intelligence, probably because well they look exactly the same um, face wise so the two cousins embrace everyone is is happy Metallurgix is safe and sound actually when they arrived in the cellar he was busy working on another golden sickle like if you look in the room there a bunch of golden sickles like a whole heap of golden sickles in the corner and he turns he sees Obelix and Obelix he introduces uh, Metallurgix to, to Asterix. And then the Centurion and his men, they are escorting the, the Prefect and Navy Strix down into the cellar. They're chained up and all. And he orders for Metallurgix to be released because they've got the two culprits now. And we see dairy produce is, surplus dairy produce is 
he's all excited now because you know something major has happened despite that he's been caught but he's thinking okay what will, what would Julius Caesar say when he finds out about this maybe they'll end up in the circus being chased around by lions and navy tricks he now he's quite the opposite he's not he's not looking forward to what will happen to them he's not thrilled at all about this but the operation has come to an end now so Asterix, Obelix and Metallurgix they leave the prefect's residence they've got the sickles and they go back to the forest to pick up the other golden sickles and then several hours later they make it back to Metallurgix's house where they have something to eat and refresh and Metallurgix he thanks Asterix and Obelix for rescuing him and to reward them he hands them a golden sickle for Getafix and Asterix is like oh we need to we need to pay you for this but Metallurgix he's like no you guys you saved me so this is this is for you free of charge and so afterwards Asterix and Obelix they leave Lutetia they say farewell to, to Metallurgix and they make their way back to the village it's a, it's a pretty uneventful journey although they do encounter a couple of, of bandits here and there but eventually they make it back to the village and they are welcomed as heroes because they have got a golden sickle for their druid and Asterix he presents it to Getafix who is grateful and is happy that uh, the two ghouls they came back safe and sound and Asterix and Obelix's adventure comes to a close of course with a banquet and this is where we see on the final page we see uh, Cacophonix he's bound and gagged he's not joining in the festivities he's been cooped up in some house and of course this will be the first of many times where the man with the golden voice is bound and gagged before he can get a chance to to sing and celebrate with the others so i just thought it was it was a nice touch but well this is it this is where we reach the end of a pretty eventful adventure asterix and the the golden sickle i think for many fans this would be where the signature the, you know the trademark for what Asterix um, the comics are known for this is where it started because we got Asterix and Obelix journeying together leaving the village and going off on uh, a big adventure unlike in book one where we did get to see Obelix but he stayed in the village while Asterix he he left to to rescue Getafix from the the camp compendium so you know this would be where the you know the adventuring starts and we get a couple of, of, of signature traits you know like Asterix and Obelix uh, bickering over this or that Obelix you know being unreasonable being un unreasonable at times these would be you know running gags throughout the series but I thought it was just nice that this is where all that started and it just makes you look forward to what else what other adventures do Asterix and Obelix go on later on so um, this would have been the point where I was going to you know open up the email and check for feedback from you to find out what you think about this book you know Asterix and the Golden Sickle but fortunately no no feedback but I'll continue to ask that if you have any any feedback for any of the asterisk books that we'll be diving into there in the description you will find the, the email address asterisk audio series at xmail.net that's asterisk audio series at xmail.net that's where you can send all your feedback or even any any stories that you'd like to share uh, during your time as a fan of, of asterisk maybe what was the first comic book you read 
your favorite movie, if you played any of the games, anything that you'd like to share, you can send it um, to that email address. Please make sure to include your, your name and where you're writing from so that when I'm reading the emails, I'll know um, who sent which email and I can you know, properly identify you when I go through the feedback. As for, for trivia, um, there are a couple of trivia notes that we can look into just a little bit. Like uh, the two names of uh, Navy Strix and Clover Garlics. Navy Strix. His name is a combination of Navish and Trix. Now, someone who is described as being Navish is someone who is skilled at being uh, deceitful. So, Navy Strix. And then Clover Garlics. Uh, clove of garlic um, picture a, a bulb of garlic right now a bulb of garlic is made up of uh, smaller bulbs right if you detach one of those smaller bulbs that small bulb that's a clove so clove of garlics that's that's where we get their names and then there was a plan to do a uh, an animated movie adaptation of Asterix and the Golden Sickle, but unfortunately, after how the movie adaptation of Asterix the Goal was received, it was poorly done and poorly received. Uh, Gosini and Udozo they just turned down the idea of doing. In Asterix and the Golden Sickle movie, they, they turned it down. But the good news is they would go on to direct um, one of the Asterix movies. I'm sure you might know which movie that is. We'll get into the comic book at some point, but I guess that's the good news. And maybe I'll do a uh, review of that movie after we've gone through the comic book. And then one more bit of trivia is about the prefect surplus dairy produce he um, was modeled after a an english actor by the name of charles uh, charles lawton i hope i got that right that's l-a-u-g-h-t-o-n charles lawton he was uh, famous for a couple of major movies i think two that um, were well known were Mutiny on the Bounty, which came out in 1935, and then he played a role in the big blockbuster Spartacus in 1960. So Charles Lawton, that's where we get prefect surplus dairy produce. But I'd say like modern, I'm thinking modern uh, people. Like right now, based on what's, on what's happening, like right now, it's since February 2022. So I'm saying, if I could think of one person who comes close to being uh, maybe a model of a surplus dairy produce, I would think of uh, current British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Uh, not only because of you know, how he looks and you know being a big man, but I think like in my head, when I think of surplus dairy produce, how he speaks, if you read his his dialogue in the comic, I think of of Boris Johnson, and I hear that that voice reading reading the dialogue. So you can just look into Charles Lawton. If any of you are were fans of his work, then um, maybe sometime you can go back and have a look at his movies. But now you know where we got. The prefect surplus dairy produce so in the next episode we'll be looking at book three which is asterix and the goths we met one goth in this volume we'll get plenty more in the next volume so i hope you're looking forward to that and of course if you've got uh, asterix and the goths feel free to start reading it now and you can send in any feedback that you have about that volume. I'm looking forward to, to, to receiving that. 
now or some uh, a deprogramming notes if I have to uh, borrow, a, borrow a term just wanted to share this with you regarding what's what's going on in the real world now the house where um, my family and I are staying we've been renting it since two, 2014 that's when we moved in here so uh, the landlord now uh, he's given us until April to, to find a new place because we haven't been paying rent on time. Uh, you know, not just because of COVID, but you know, being in Zim, things haven't been uh, too good around here. So, you know, the people that we supply our products with, because uh, like here at home, um, the old man. He's got a manufacturing business, so my brother and I, we help him with that. So the people that we supply, they delay in their payments and in turn rent is, is delayed as well. So I guess the landlord, he just reached a breaking point and uh, he just decided, no, he's going to let us go. So. Initially, my plan had been February, I take a break and then come back in March to continue with the content. But now that we have to move, um, I'm not sure what March is going to look like. And April as well. I'm hoping maybe by then would have found a new place and settled in and then uh, I can continue with the content. So I just wanted to let you know what the situation is and just in case I don't come back in March, I don't come back in April, maybe early May, uh, latest, but hopefully in April at some point would have settled in and if I do get the chance to continue with the content, I'll continue with the content with releasing new episodes and stuff. So. Uh, that's the little heads up. Uh, please understand these things happen. You know, uh, I'm guessing maybe uh, the landlord might have owed other people money, and they were pressuring him to pay up, and so he pressures people who are paying, who are owing him money, um, which would be his tenants or whoever. So it's this is the stuff that happens. But you know, we just just move on and get on with our lives and hope for the best and see what happens uh, down the road so yeah that's uh that's my closing note uh, thank you for listening to this episode um there is a link to episode one in the description is our saying so you can go back and listen to that as well until then take care and look forward to the next episode of asterix and the indomitable audio series. Take care.